Hello everyone. First of all, I'd really like to apologise for the delay. Um, if I was doing my interview, I'd really be hassling the person to get get the video done, like they promised. Um, and I feel kind of bad, so I'm doing this in a major rush because I know that some of you will be having an interview tomorrow. Um, so I'm still wearing pyjamas, I'm still wearing my morning gown, but I really want to get this information out to you guys so that you guys possibly will feel a bit more confident going into the interviews tomorrow and whenever you're having your interview thereafter. Without further ado or too much talking, let's just dive straight in the question and get straight to the point. So first of all, we will be covering the remaining chemistry question, then we will be going into the maths interview. Question number one. Write down the formula for Ido pentaoxide. So when you first look at this question or when you first hear this question, the best thing to do is to start thinking about breaking down the words in the formula. So you hear the word Ido, you hear the word penta, and you hear the word oxide. From the word Ido, you might gather that there is an iodine molecule present in the formula. Then we hear the word oxide, which means there is oxygen present. So there are iodines and there are oxygens somehow. And the word penta usually refers to the number five. So then you might start to think that it's iodine and five oxygen. So iodo penta oxide. In my interview, I initially wrote down IO5, which is what I'd gathered from the name iodo penta oxide. However, this is wrong and it's not Bad if you got this wrong yourself. I figured most people would probably not realise the trick. Um, but the good thing about interviews is they are not there to trick you and they're not there to see you fail. They're there to see if they give you a new piece of information, can you then possibly work it out? Um, so my interviewer then told me to look at the oxidation states and see if it would be possible to form such a molecule, even if it did or did not exist. And if we look at the oxidation states, we can see that in every single um, molecule, oxygen has an oxidation state of negative two, except in hydrogen peroxide, where it has an oxidation state of negative one. So if there are five oxygen atoms, uh, that's a total of negative 10. And to make an overall neutral molecule, iodine should therefore have an oxidation state of positive 10. Um, and this is clearly not possible, which I was asked, is this possible? Um, to which I responded no, and the reason that this wasn't possible, which I gave, was because there are not 10 valence electrons available for iodine to lose, so it can therefore never really have a plus 10 charge. Um, and that was good, so my interviewer then told me that's right, so the formula is actually I2O5. I was then asked the next question. Draw the structure of this molecule. To um, start thinking about this question, you need to start thinking about what number of bonds atoms usually like to make. And we know that oxygen loves to make two bonds in order to gain a full shell of outer electrons um, and, and be stable. So if we know that every oxygen atom insists on having two bonds, we then need to start thinking about how many atoms we have of each thing and how we can distribute the atoms. So we know that we have five oxygen atoms um, somehow bonded to two iodine atoms. So whenever you draw molecules, you always need to start thinking about how can I symmet symmetrically distribute these atoms whilst adhering to the fact that they want to make a certain number of bonds. We know that if we take two on one iodine and two on another iodine, that's okay, both iodines now have two oxygens. But then we have one oxygen left and we need to try and distribute this symmetrically and at the same time have that oxygen make two bonds. So what we can do is with the last oxygen make it a bridging oxygen um, and have one bond to one iodine and one bond to another iodine and that way it still has two bonds and both iodines essentially have two and a half oxygen atoms which is perfectly symmetrical. The next question was Draw the shape of this molecule focusing only on one central iodine atom. For this question, like the question details, we're only looking at one iodine atom. So if we look at one iodine atom and kind of throw away the other one, we can see that the iodine is surrounded by a total of three oxygens. Um, and 
In terms of thinking about how, what shape and geometry this might take, we also need to take into account any lone pairs that there might be. So iodine has, is in group seven, which means it has a seven valence electrons. We can see that it's formed in terms of number of bonds to oxygen, two double bonds. So that's four in total. And then one single bond. So that's one more electron gone into a bonding pair which leaves two electrons, which makes a lone pair. So we can see that iodine has formed bonds to three atoms and has one lone pair remaining. Um, so in total, that's kind of four things around iodine, which we know is a tetrahedral geometry. That was the end of the chemistry questions. Um, I hope that was helpful. We'll now be moving on to the maths interview. And for the maths interview, there were two main questions which made up the bulk of the interview. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. For the first question, draw the function of one over one minus the square root of X. Before we start discussing this question, I would just like to mention the fact that through talking to other people from other colleges, I seem to get this theme of drawing functions that at first sound ridiculous. If I had to kind of predict a question that you might expect to get in your maths interview for natural sciences, I would say that you could maybe expect to get uh, a question which asks you to draw a function which might blow you away at first but it's actually quite easy if you just take these simple steps. So when drawing any unknown function I think it's very important to ask yourself four main questions. These four questions will be um, will allow you to explore the behavior of the function as x takes certain different values. So the four questions are is there an asymptote in this function? What happens when x equals to zero? What happens as x approaches positive infinity? What happens as x approaches negative infinity? So first of the four questions, is there an asymptote in this function? So an asymptote is a horizontal or a vertical line in a curve, which the graph might approach, but never ever crosses. The function will never take the value of the asymptote, if that makes sense. If we look at this function and we begin to think at what value of x does this graph have no defined value and we can see that if the denominator if the denominator is equal to zero then the function is undefined. Um, the denominator will equal to zero when the square root of x is equal to one um, and this means x equals one. So at the value of x equals one, there is an asymptote. So we can start to begin to draw the first feature on our expected graph. Number two, what happens when x equals zero? So when x equals zero, um, we can plug that straight into our formula. So we have one over one minus the square root of zero, which is one over one. So the function equals one, when x equals zero. So we have our first point of the graph, zero, one. So that will be another feature that we can add to our graph. Number three, what happens when x approaches positive infinity? So now that we have an asymptote on our graph, we need to start thinking about what happens as x goes to, as x takes a positive value before the asymptote and what happens as x takes a positive value after the asymptote. So here we're breaking our graph down as what happens when x takes a value zero to one and what happens when x takes the value greater than one. So first of all, when x takes a number that is greater than zero yet less than one, we can see that essentially we're getting something along the lines of one over one minus something that is smaller than one, which equals one over something that is a decimal point overall. And when we divide one by a decimal point, we always get a bigger number. So essentially, as x approaches the number one asymptote, y will turn to positive infinity. So we kind of will expect a rapid growth in y as x approaches the asymptote. So this is another feature we can add to our graph. And now we need to start thinking about what happens when x is greater than the value of one. So after the asymptote. 
And when x takes a value greater than 1, we essentially get 1 over 1 minus something that's bigger than 1, which means 1 over a negative value. The values of y beyond the asymptote will always be negative. But the bigger we make this number, the smaller a value we get for y. This means that y has come from a very, very large negative approaching nearly zero. So essentially what I'm saying is that if we take any value greater than one, we know it's going to be negative. When we take values that are closer to one, the denominator is smaller, so the overall fraction is bigger. So that's a large negative. When we take values that are a lot bigger than one, the denominator becomes bigger and the overall fraction becomes smaller. So we're approaching zero. So after the asymptote, the function y turns from a large negative approaching to zero. So that's another feature we can add to our graphs. The final thing is if we consider x taking a negative value, um, we see that we get the square root of a negative value. This value is undefined. You might learn uh, about imaginary numbers if you come uh, and do the maths course in part 1a. Uh, you might have already encountered imaginary values if you've taken further maths. But in order to sketch this graph, uh, we simply say that x will not take any negative values because that will lead to an undefined um, function. And there we have it, the uh, function that we at first didn't know, but we can actually break down into smaller and smaller pieces to study the behaviour of y as x takes different values. And I think the key point of this question is not to be able to sketch the graph without even discussing your thought process. The absolute, absolute, absolute key for me is to tell the interviewer that you're thinking about these things, that you've thought about where the asymptote is, that you've thought about what happens to y when x is equal to zero, that you've considered what happens when x goes to positive infinity, and that you've considered that x cannot take a negative value. So the next question is quite a long question, so I'm going to read it out, but obviously it will be displayed so you can read it for yourself. I have a piece of paper, length L. I cut squares out of the corner, length R. Make a box from the remaining piece of paper left over. What length should R be in order for me to get the biggest volume out of the box? So that was a long question, and at first you might think, what the hell, what do I do with this? But as I've mentioned before, discussion of thought process is key. So what I did for my um, for my approach to this question was I told the interviewer that I'd like to kind of draw what's going on, draw a picture of what's happening. So at first I drew um, a box, a piece of paper which had length L, so a square piece of paper with both sides labelled length L. I then cut squares out of the corners of these pieces of paper and labelled them length R. And now from this you get a picture of the remaining piece of paper and you're able to give a formula for the volume if you were to fold this box. So we can see that if we folded this box we'd have um, the length L minus 2R and a height of R. So then we can simply say that the volume of the box will be the height temp t the width times the length times the height. The width is L minus 2R, the length is L minus 2R, and the height is R. So we get R times L minus 2R squared, and that's the volume of the box. Now, he asked what length would R have to be in order to get the maximum volume of the box. The word maximum is key. In maths, whenever we're trying to find a minimum or a maximum, straight away you think of differentiation. When we differentiate a function and set that differentiation equal to zero, we get the maximum and the minimum turning points on the graph. Uh, and these correspond to maximum volumes or minimum volumes. So with our equation, V, the volume, equals r times l minus 2r squared, uh, 
um, all we need to do is take dv and differentiate it with respect to the variable r because that's what we're thinking about changing and set that equal to zero. So hopefully at this stage you'll be very comfortable with the idea of differentiation. Um, by the time my interview had come around I had actually done differentiation a long while ago so I had to really take it in baby steps and I didn't even initially know that differentiation was the approach I had to take. Um, it had been so long that I was like I needed a lot of prompting. Um, the interviewer had to say you know where in maths have you ever learnt about finding maximum and I was like integration and he was like the other one differentiation that's it um so i say that just to get you comfortable with the idea that you can really like feel like you've messed up and they just want you to be able to propose something so it's not really about being super confident and knowing oh yeah we're, we're, when it's maximum you know it's differentiation like no one cares no one cares that you are a wizard knowing what technique to use as long as you are able to think you know that's the key and i was able to think enough to eventually come to the answer. But anyway, back to the point. If we differentiate this function, we can easily see what the optimum value of r should be in order to obtain the maximum value of the box. And those were two super long maths questions and they really did make up the bulk of the interview. This interview will go by super, super fast It'll be over before you know it. Um, I don't believe there were many questions. It was mainly two main questions which really, really made you think um, and really gave you questions which you might have never approached before in school, but are actually easy to approach if you break them down, really show your thinking. And that way, if you go wrong somewhere, the, the interviewer is more capable of giving you a piece of information to kind of complete the puzzle for you. You know, if you don't, let them know what you're thinking. They don't really know where your understanding has gone wrong. So that is it. That's all for the questions. I hope this was helpful and I really do wish you the absolute best of luck tomorrow. Please, please, please share your thought process. Please admit when you need a piece of information and please do dig deep to try and answer the question. Please don't be the person that just... Blah, blah, uh, uh. <laughs> the person that just says I don't know to everything because they cannot gather how well you can think if you just say I don't know to everything. That's it from me. Um, I wish you the absolute best of luck and let me know how it goes in the comment below after you've had your interview. But for now, bye bye.